I thought what I would do um, in this presentation, instead of giving any kind of synopsis of the book, uh, would just be uh, to talk a little bit, roughly 30 minutes or so, about how it took form, give kind of an uh, origin story. But of course, any kind of project like this has uh, multiple origin stories. What I'll focus on, I guess, first will be the travel, um, concretely, that stood behind this and generated the first questions uh, that developed ultimately into the book. Then I'll say a bit about research and school. And then finally, um, a little bit about the writing and in fact, the, the production of the book. But those things are difficult to disentangle. So in fact, um, those won't be three sections to the talk, but rather three strands uh, that run through it. I'll start just by um, embarrassing myself. That's um, 1998 um, uh, on the Euphrates. Um, this is what I looked like before I went to graduate school. <laughs> um, I'm standing next to my friend from college, Skip Campbell, who didn't go to graduate school and still looks exactly like that. <laughs> um, so uh, this was an opportunity that I had in January of 1998, which was my senior year at Williams College. Uh, Williams has a, a January term, a winter term, that's required of all students. And often there are these opportunities for uh, travel. In this case, something that we really couldn't do anymore. Um, uh, this was a trip with a professor of religion named Bill Darrow, who taught a history of Islam at Williams, um, to Jordan and to Syria. Uh, so this photograph shows us, I think, somewhere near uh, Lake Assad, that's say sort of roughly near um, Raqqa, um, on uh, the Euphrates in the Syrian uh, leg of the trip. But it was actually um, it, it, the Jordanian part, which you, you, know, you still um, can visit. Um, sorry, it's a little bit lopsided. This is me just scanning the um, album pages from my uh, old photographs, all of these obviously shot on 35 millimeter. Um, and then printed at some point. Uh, this is a building called uh, Qasir Amra, uh, which is about uh, 50 miles, let's say, east of Amman, of the capital of Jordan. And not exactly in the desert, but very much in the steppe. You see there's some scrubby growth around. This isn't a totally arid landscape. And actually, in, uh, in the early Middle Ages, it was a kind of hunting ground uh, where the caliphs of the first uh, dynasty of the Islamic State, the Umayyad Caliphs uh, would go to hunt foxes and gazelles and various other animals that uh, lived in the vicinity. And the building that you're looking at is a, a bathhouse primarily, or rather it's a reception hall that's attached to a bathhouse. Um, this winch uh, over here uh, is actually um, a, a well. Um, that's been set up in order to draw water to feed the bath. And when you go inside, um, as we did on this trip, you see uh, paintings, um, frescoes, on the walls of basically all of the surfaces of the interior. It's nearly uh, entirely covered with what are, in some cases, uh, very enigmatic images. Here you have a kind of Cupid, sort of Eros figure, um, and a couple of reclining figures. How you're supposed to piece this all together um, remains unclear to many scholars, but what's obvious is that the painters are borrowing directly from the artistic vocabulary of earlier centuries in the Eastern or in the wider Mediterranean world, that's to say from Greek and Roman art. And that becomes most um, spectacularly clear when you walk into the Calderium, that's to say the hot room, a sort of sauna basically, of the bath complex, um, and look up in the dome. I couldn't, with my old camera, I, I needed two photos in order to get the two halves of the dome. What you see are, in fact, um, images of the constellations. Um, what can you pick out here? For example, this um, would be the figure of Sagittarius, of the archer. And as you start to put all of these together, uh, you realize that uh, an image of the entirety of the uh, outer sphere of the fixed stars uh, 
the way that people imagined uh, the universe in antiquity as being uh, spherical with the stars that we see on the night sky and the outermost firmament. Um, these have been projected on the interior of this hemisphere. So it's actually a fairly complicated projection um, and include the zodiac, the ecliptic. Um, that's to say the path that the sun cuts across the sphere of the fixed stars over the course of the year. And all of these uh, stars are here um, indicated not simply by points, but also with the figures drawn in various individuals. This is Andromeda sort of in free fall here um, that were originally put together in really ancient Near Eastern um, uh, sort of palatial contexts, but then get adapted and adopted in Greco-Roman antiquity um, and are still being actively used in order to talk about the night sky by um, the Muslim patrons and possibly also Muslim painters in the early eighth century. And that was mind-blowing to me. So I had a vague notion as an art history major um, that early Christian art, Byzantine art, had some kind of relationship to what we think of as classical art, the art of Greco-Roman antiquity. But I'd say really before walking into this structure, it's not something that was taught in the curriculum. I had no sense of early Islamic art as also being part of that same um, tradition. But actually, it became clear on this trip um, that this was not an isolated monument, but that this was part of a broader um, phenomenon. Other um, monuments that told a similar story, one of which actually would end up also playing a large role um, in the book, uh, the extensively mosaiced uh, Great Mosque in Damascus, also built under the Umayyads, also built in the first part of um, the eighth century, um, as well as the various monuments. This is somewhat randomly uh, included here simply because it was on the top of the album page, but this is the shrine of uh, St. Tekla in Malula, in um, what is a, a Christian uh, community, um, that also exhibits much of the same engagement with the Roman past of the region. That interest, in fact, I don't think that this is, I have a couple of apocryphal stories, but I don't think either of them are actually apocryphal. I think um, that when I was standing there staring at the constellations on the dome in Qasair Amra, uh, Bill Darrow, uh, the professor who was leading the trip, said to me, this would be a really good topic for a dissertation. <laughs> Maybe. That's it. I did end up going back there um, 11 years afterwards. Um, and uh, this is, it goes back to Jordan, but also to, again, to Syria um, on the same trip. And this time with a sort of much more focused set of questions, by this time I knew uh, that I was uh, writing about this material and with a new camera, um, with a digital camera, and with a different eye, I'd say, um, that was now informed by having read through all of the extensive archaeological literature uh, about these structures. So at this point, um, I'm particularly interested in isolating individual figures and especially trying to get the figures that are most completely legible um, from what is a pretty extensively damaged uh, fresco program. But also, um, back in Damascus, with much more of an interest um, in the social space of this structure, which uh, was in 2009, and I assume today, despite everything, remains um, a major, despite being a sort of uh, monument of uh, world heritage and a, um, a sort of a religiously significant building, also a kind of uh, gathering space um, for uh, people within the city um, to pass through on their way from um, one place to another, the social aspects of it became much more obvious to me, I think, um, on that later trip. So these are just two buildings that did end up being um, in the book. Now I've just shamelessly scanned in um, uh, open openings um, from uh, the book itself. Um, just to say that I hope that in some ways both of these things uh, come through. When I'm talking about the Great Mosque, in order for this to have any relationship to the 
topic of the book, Cosmos and Community. The emphasis in the case of the Great Mosque is certainly more on community, but the cosmic aspect um, also comes out once you piece together the literature, the traveler's reports that we have from uh, earlier visits, much, much earlier visits um, to the building, people who still saw inscriptions that ran on the interior that included, for example, um, one of the most uh, famous verses in the Quran, the so-called um, uh, throne verse next to the throne of the ruler, um, the um, uh, minbar that the uh, ruler of the Islamic um, caliphate would ascend uh, on Fridays when he happened to be in town, um, and uh, the text proclaiming next to him that his throne um, strides, uh, bestrides heaven and earth both. Also then describing the destruction of the universe with other um, passages from the Quran. This put the cosmic element um, into a discussion of this building, which is not as literally obvious when you look at the mosaics that are still preserved, as might be the case in Qasair Amra. So that requires a lot of um, the sort of library work and the plans that I drew and so forth. But I hope that there's still in this some um, bit of the uh, wonder and uh, fascination that these gorgeous mosaics had for me from the first time um, that I went to the place in 1998. The same, I hope, also then holds true um, for Qasir Amra, um, where uh, here neither of these photographs are by me. Um, this is a photograph by Jane Taylor, who's an amazing woman who's done a series of sort of aerial surveys of the monuments of Jordan. She's done a lot in Petra, um, giving you a view um, from the sky uh, of the complex. And uh, this is a photograph uh, by my friend uh, Susanna McFadden, who's a scholar of Roman art and late antique art. Um, she, we were there together. She just got better photos than I did. Um, but I hope that this, again, um, is able in the images not just to make an argument about the site, but to capture something of the surprise um, and the interest that's awoken by finding a tiny little uh, building in the middle of the steps and walking inside and seeing it full of just this riotous um, set of images of um, frescoes. Uh, that's a little bit then on the theme of travel. Um, now to the theme of uh, research. The, uh, the, the, this is another apocryphal story, but it's true. The, uh, dissertation began with a seminar paper that I wrote in, what do I say here, 2005, um, in a graduate seminar at Bryn Mawr on uh, reception that was taught by a professor of art history, David Kast, and a professor of classics, Julia Geiser. Um, and I wrote a paper about the Colossus of Rhodes, and I won't piece together how that then related to this paragraph. I think that there was a lot of sort of very... Um, typical of the stage of the career sort of showing off um, going on here. Um, for example, the first sentence, but Byzantium was not the only heir of Rome, is a little bit um, pompous. But um, the general idea here um, was that there is a kind of contest between three states in uh, the early Middle Ages, really by the time we hit 700, for um, not just the political hegemony in the Mediterranean, but also uh, the um, inheritance of uh, Greco-Roman antiquity and a concretely cultural um, and, uh, in many cases, scientific uh, sense. So what I write here is that for Franks, Byzantines, and Arabs alike, um, this claim included an artistic component. The parallel appropriation of classical artistic heritage by the three kingdoms may be indicated by referring to three astronomical monuments each of which represent the fixed stars according to iconographic conventions of Greco-Roman astrology. Um, the Leiden Aratea, a Carolingian manuscript, the Vatican Handy Table, Tables, a Byzantine manuscript, and the Caldarium Dome of Qasir Amra, a desert residence of the 8th century Umayyad caliphs that we've just been looking at. Um, then I say, so it's surely no accident that all three should be uh, private monuments produced for the contemplation of rulers in their courts, nor that they should take as their subject the cosmos itself, expressed in the artistic language of Roman antiquity. Um, in his each, I didn't proofread this very well, uh, the ruler could see himself as the master of the civilized world. Um, so that's, there's nothing apocryphal there, that's real. But I couldn't um, find the uh, hard copy 
that I turned in, but I distinctly recall uh, that Professor Cast had written in the margin, say more, right? So I've always <laughs> blamed him for what happened afterwards. Um, but that's the comparison that actually uh, sort of begins the book. That much, in a sense, didn't change. So it's a different Carolingian manuscript that I end up um, taking. This is uh, one in Munich, so it's not the Leiden manuscript. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you have that same Byzantine manuscript that I mentioned, and then Sagittarius there um, in Cossair Amra, Sagittarius in all cases, just in order to uh, demonstrate that it was the same set of forms, the same iconography that was being employed to represent the entirety of the cosmos by artists working in these three different states. But the part that I'd no longer hold to is, is where I ended up here, and this is the part that really changed as I was thinking um, more deeply about this material, and I said um, something like, in each of these monuments, the ruler could see himself as master of the civilized world. That's, I mean, it's a very standard claim that's made about these things, that you look at them and it is a sort of um, a claim to world rule on the part of an individual in any one of these monuments. And what really started to jolt me out of that um, it, was, it was actually a, a totally different kind of thing. Um, so uh, this is a picture which is in the collection of the Met, um, but I saw it for the first time the year after that seminar paper, I think, in, um, in the Hirshhorn Museum in DC, and it's a, a watercolor from the 70s by Anselm Kiefer, who's a German painter. It's actually quite small, so it's six times its actual size on the screen here. It's not a monumental picture at all. It's a very uh, fragile sort of um, picture. Uh, and the title is Jeder Mensch steht unter sein Himmelskugel, Every Man Stands Under His Dome of Heaven. Um, and what it represents is this kind of blue bubble, um, like a hemisphere, and a tiny little individual standing in the middle of it. And that individual, as was pretty common in Kiefer's work of this period, this is the early stuff before Kiefer becomes really massively famous, um, he's making the Hitler salute, actually. This is the, the Hitler Gruss. Um, so there's an explicitly um, tyrannical um, aspect to this image that immediately um, throws the sort of um, political or ethical claim of this picture into confusion. I don't know that it resolves into a sort of simple um, understanding, but there's definitely an association there, a profoundly negative association between, uh, that's being attached to an individual framing him or herself as essentially the, at the center of the world. And it didn't strike me as accidental that the image of the world that was being reached for here um, was actually uh, you know, the old one, the Ptolemaic one, the overthrown one, right? We, we now know that there is no dome of heaven um, as such, uh, but that's the image, the shorthand that the painter goes for um, in this particular case. And so it, whatever this did, it planted a kind of seed of doubt about the pat narrative, or the way the sort of pious narrative about these monuments, that they were claims to world rule. It made it seem to me more problematic and possibly um, a little bit unreflective. And so it's actually not those three pictures of Sagittarius, but um, this picture, which ends up then uh, as figure one um, in the book. It's, it's where I start. Um, it, it's the first image I talk about. But it, I didn't want the question to be something about, well, was it this or is it that? Was it good or is it bad? Um, I wanted both of these options to be available in interpreting these monuments. The really uh, sort of robustly pious claim to world rule and the very skeptical um, intimation that there might be something profoundly tyrannical um, and, uh, in fact, unethical about uh, claims of this sort, which probably would have occurred to people in other times and places too, so maybe if that claim is all we see, we're missing some other aspect of what's going on um, in these kinds of monuments. What pulled all of that together then for me so that it didn't have to be an either or uh, was the, the third thing, and um, this I really did yesterday go back and, and see when I first had notes 
of having come across this passage, so it was two years later, um, 2008, um, in uh, the work of a third century Roman historian uh, writing about his contemporary, the emperor Septimius Severus. Uh, and the historian says that the emperor saw that his sons were changing their mode of life, they're getting lazy, and the legions were becoming enervated by idleness. So he decided to go to war. So he made a campaign against Britain. Although he knew that he should not return. Why is that? Well, he knew this chiefly from the stars under which he had been born. For he had caused them to be painted on the ceilings of the rooms in the palace where he held court, so that they were visible to all, with the exception of that portion of the sky which, as astrologers say, observed the hour when he first saw the light. This is the so-called ascendant on the basis of which you can cast the horoscope, the natal horoscope of any individual. For this portion, he had not depicted in the same way in both rooms. It's a peculiar little anecdote, and then the historian just sort of moves on and doesn't uh, unpack it. But you have there what I first had in my mind, that's to say this uh, image of the emperor sitting there in a room with the ceiling that's painted with the stars. Uh, and this is certainly the first thing, if this is true, that any individual would remark upon on walking into the reception hall of the Roman emperor, uh, here's a kind of claim to world rule. Of course, in the case of the Romans, um, this was a, a shared pride when you get descriptions of actual monuments like this. They say the best thing about being Roman is that whenever you look at a picture of the world, uh, you know that it all belongs to you, right? So it's not just the emperor, um, but it's all citizens of the state who could participate in this kind of um, uh, game. But it turns out uh, that if you have a little bit more expert knowledge about what's being depicted here, if you identify here not just some heavenly bodies, but a specific configuration that refers to the moment in which a particular emperor was born, then suddenly uh, you have a really dangerous uh, potential. That's to say, you could work out the date of his death if you understand astrology. And you have plenty of um, procedures for doing this in the handbooks of the ancient astrologers. If you know when the emperor is going to die, um, that's uh, something that it has a lot of value, obviously, in any um, uh, sort of um, hierarchical society like this. You can start plotting your way um, into a better position in the reign of the successor. And then finally, um, it, once this thought has struck you, apparently, you could be led into a different room where suddenly your whole plan would be thrown into confusion because you'd see that there were actually two versions, two different versions of the horoscope of the emperor that were depicted in these two different rooms. So now what you know is actually that you don't know, that there's a choice, and you can't work out which of them is true. So that ultimately, um, the emperor is the only individual who has the full truth of this account. And what it tells him um, isn't that he's the ruler of the world, it's that he's about to die. Right? So sort of where this um, ends. So there's a kind of game of progress progressive exclusions, if you like, that create, just through working through this image, um, a tension between a uh, claim to sort of universal sovereignty on the one hand and a very profoundly um, individual, solitary, um, mortal um, kind of burden on the other hand. And this is ultimately the tension between these two poles of the cosmic image that I try to um, work through. I see it in the Byzantine, in the Frankish, and in the Islamic states between about 700 and 1,000, which is the um, time span of the study, but I see it being inflected in different ways, and I try to use it as a point from which it's possible to compare the way that society is developing in its relationship to the cosmos in these, two different, in these three different um, contexts. I'll conclude then, um, I didn't want to go much past five o'clock, so uh, this is the last image that made its way into the book. So we've got sort of um, the origins of it. Um, this didn't make it in until this almost didn't make it in. Um, 
the process of uh, Yale is this spectacularly professional and well-oiled machine in terms of producing these books, and you could really miss the boat. There's sort of no once they're in train, um, it's uh, it's on its way, and there's nothing that you can do about it. But I realized so it, it, when I get around to the final chapter of the book, what I'm primarily concerned about is why you don't get a really continuous, dense tradition of representations of the cosmos, even if it's just a kind of shorthand like the zodiac, um, in Byzantium that you do get in the other states. If you just look at the numbers, um, we have these uh, profound um, booms in the production of basically images of the constellations, especially in manuscripts, um, in the Islamic world, in the Frankish world, um, by the time we hit the year 1000, and nothing comparable, just scattered monuments in Byzantium. And I know that at some point, I'd looked at this image before. This is a stray folio, just a sort of detached page, which has been bound into the front of a collection of uh, Greek tragedies, uh, but shows, um, and in fact, it includes a kind of a, a table of contents of what follows, but also includes then this uh, image of the zodiac, which looks perfectly unexceptional until you realize that Scorpio uh, is spread over two of the wedges here. At least that's how it appears. And in fact, this ends up at some point in the hands of a Latin speaker. It's a Greek book, but it makes its way elsewhere. And you see that the Latin scribe has gone around and provided the names of all of the constellations in Latin, except here, Scorpio, and then there's nothing else. It just looks like it's an image of, um, of Scorpio. If I'd ever seen that um, before 2015, I think I probably did, um, it probably didn't strike me as particularly um, exceptional. I probably didn't notice this. It wasn't discussed in the commentaries on it. And I certainly wouldn't have known how to explain it, but it's quite remarkable, actually, because in the earlier, earlier Hellenistic, that's to say sort of third century BC until, accounts of the zodiac, you don't have Scorpio, Libra, Virgo. Instead, you have the scorpion, its claws, and then Virgo. And Libra is represented later as a replacement for the claws. So in other words, um, it, what I'd found was something that perfectly proved what I was trying to argue here, which was that um, these later Byzantine zodiacs, which we do get, are not representatives of some continuous tradition of representation of the constellations, but they constantly reach back. We can really demonstrate in this case that this other roughly contemporary later Byzantine thing is a copy of a late antique book. In this case, too, they're reaching back to an archaic version of the zodiac that they've found somewhere. It hasn't undergone um, the later developments of the tradition. So it was in just enough time that I was able to um, put in a rush order for a copy of the image from the Bodleian uh, Library in Oxford and rewrite the introduction to the fourth chapter to highlight this um, as sort of exhibit A uh, for the argument uh, that I wanted to make, which is one of those sort of um, seams in the production process uh, that hopefully gets smoothed over by the um, designers and so forth. So in the end, it looks as if it belonged there um, from the very beginning. That's all I have to say. I thank you for your attention, and I'm more than happy um, to take questions. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. This was a wonderful um, history of your book. And uh, it made, makes me think also of a talk that you gave, talk, uh, when you talked about the um, circulation of manuscripts. And I wonder, um, the, the idea of community is something new to me that maybe I didn't grasp at the time. Mm -hmm. So I wonder whether you could talk a little bit more about it. Where do you think this mm -hmm. community comes into play? I mean, mm -hmm. they, nobody, only a small community had access to these manuscripts. Sure. And also to the, I mean, the mosque would have been, uh, places like this would have been, as you said, places where people would gather, but before, I'm not quite sure where you would place, or what kind of community you, you were talking about. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and community did, again, come relatively late in the project. It wasn't always here um, in the way that I was thinking about it. 
Uh, I skipped over the, the, most of the material. That's not true. So Kosei um, Ramra is uh, part of this. Um, let me just flip back to that. So uh, this is a good example of what I'm interested in here. You have this building. Um, and it, it's a little bit isolated, but we suspected for a long time and now know on the basis of inscriptions that were found there that it was built um, at the behest of a member of the, of the royal family, basically. Um, the guy who's at the time that it's built, the brother of the caliph, and then he later becomes caliph himself. Um, and when you go into the bath part of it, so this is the reception hall. Um, which is the interior that's depicted over here. You enter there first, and then you take a left, and you walk into a little bath that's basically built on the Roman model. So you have a cold room, a warm room, and a hot room, as well as a changing room um, at the entry to it. And when you walk into the, um, uh, the hot room, those are the pictures that I showed, uh, you look up, and suddenly you see the... Um, uh, these images of the constellations um, painted on the interior of the dome. Now, the way that people had tried to get a handle on that, it's peculiar. There are some texts from antiquity that suggest there might have been similar things in other places, but we don't really have anything preserved like it. Uh, when people have tried to get a handle on it, um, there have been two options. And one of them is to go to the figure of the individual um, who was the patron of the building. And we have lots of poetry about him. This is Al-Walid ibn Yazid. He wrote poetry himself. Um, and he was a sort of bon vivant. Um, he drank a lot, he caroused. You know, he was a big partier. Um, and uh, so one aspect has been to chalk this up to his eccentricity. This was a joke on his part to put this sort of grand image um, into um, a space as sort of mundane as a, as a private bath. Uh, and the other option has been to go sort of in the other direction, but again to anchor it on this guy and to say that he would, uh, literally the argument was that this was a, a space for him to apotheosize sort of pagan mysteries where he would be acclaimed by his entourage as um, a divinity himself, which has no basis in any texts. It's just a sort of deduction from the presence of these images. So what I thought was that there's a way of thinking through this as a space of, of kind of sociability, which is primarily what these uh, structures were built for. These are places where the provincial governors, uh, members of the family, and perhaps even the caliph himself um, could go and uh, reinforce their alliances with the local elites, with the people um, who uh, essentially control the troops. This is one of the major sources for military levies during the Umayyad period. So it's very important to maintain good relations with the guys out here. Um, and you have what is obviously a very homosocial space. Um, when you go into this reception hall, you have these pictures of very scantily clad women everywhere. And there's this gigantic picture of the hunt um, and you know, various other sort of courtly uh, activities. It's clearly a very um, male space, but also one that imagines certain various forms of conviviality, right? Pro almost certainly including the sort of parties and drinking and so forth. Um, and then you walk into um, the, the calderium of this, and by this point, everybody's you know, undressed, right? And they're sort of you know, taking the steam, literally. Um, and they look up and they see an image of uh, individuals uh, that are united within a schema. So ultimately, the image of the fixed stars on the outermost sphere is, is a very unusual image. So you have these units that are all theoretically more or less equal to each other, but um, they provide you with um, it, it, profoundly individuated forms. So each one is made to be, and that's in fact the mnemonic purpose of it, um, as distinct as possible from the other one. 
but they're within this broader schema um, that sets them all more or less on equal footing. And that struck me as being um, a pretty good model for a certain idea of uh, sociability or conviviality. Um, that you could have a, a relatively large number of individuals set within a certain scheme, um, but who share something, but who retain their kind of claim to distinctiveness. In other words, their identity isn't based necessarily on their relationship to one central individual in the whole, um, in the whole account. And that, so there was poetry that pointed in this direction um, from the Umayyads, and there's definitely texts from the Franks that point in this direction that use the signs of the zodiac as uh, basically an explicit metaphor for um, the various houses of elites that the king and then later emperor has to travel to in order to solidify these social bonds that keep um, the empire going. And that seemed to me a productive, a potentially more productive way of thinking about these spaces than focusing on an individual figure, and actually thinking about these images, which ultimately are not images of apotheosis or of an individual, but are images of multitudes that are a little difficult to scan when you first encounter them. Um, so the equivalent in uh, the, the sort of um, Central Europe then is this um, Sternenmantel, um, of uh, Henry, uh, the Ottonian um, emperor, which has been, again, imagined as something that he would put on in order to claim universal rule, um, but turns out to be, when you piece together the archaeology um, of its earliest years, no such um, thing. It was a gift from one elite to another. It had a sort of transactive, um, transactional uh, aspect to it. So it was a, a an idea of coming up with a different metaphor for how these things could be understood in what they clearly always, or not always, but clearly frequently, frequently appear in these um, politically laden contexts, but in contexts where it would be inappropriate for them to be um, claims on behalf of an individual. And the other options seemed to me that they represented some, a certain notion of um, a restricted multitude. The community is not everybody. <laughs> it's the people who are invited to, to that. Yeah. Yeah. I love the story about uh, you're writing the seminar paper and having your professor just write, Say more mm -hmm. on this. Um, I'm wondering, uh, at what point in the, in the writing of this project um, did you realize what the intervention in medieval, medieval art scholarship was that you were making? Mm -hmm. um, and how did that realization come about, and what was it? I know that sometimes we do our projects, mm -hmm. we're onto something, we're onto something, but we don't really know what we're trying to, what corrective or what thing we need to add and mm -hmm. what dent we're going to make in the field. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how that came about for you and where you realized that. Um, that's a very difficult question. Um, that doesn't have an aha moment, the equivalent of one of these. Um, and I don't, think that that's entirely within any individual's knowledge. Like, I'm a little bit agnostic about being able to claim that I know now what this uh, intervention is and it, what its impact um, ought to be. I mean, there were definitely, so that, that thing about the king of the world, what I ended up calling to myself, and I, I restrained myself, and I didn't put it into the book, the, um, the, the titanic school of medieval political theology, that you have these people running around saying, I'm king of the world. Um, <laughs> thank you. So um, that was definitely an ax I had to grind. Um, and it seemed to me that it was something that had been accepted too lazily, uh, that this was the primary function of images of this sort, and that laziness relied on a, a very straightforward 
kind of um, distinction between us now and we would find anything like that ridiculous and tyrannical. That would be a sort of James Bond villain, right, who would make this kind of claim. Um, and they, them, they, them, um, who, uh, you know, of course, knew no better than to accept um, a claim of this sort and for it to, in fact, be effective um, within political systems for highly educated individuals. Um, so it, that was an intervention that I wanted to make, absolutely, um, in uh, working through uh, this material. And it, I guess that emerged slowly. Um, I don't think it's in the dissertation. I don't think I say that. I think that was sitting there in my head for a long period of time, but I think it took me a while before I wrote it down in some draft of a thing um, that I don't agree with this. And in fact, it became a kind of organizing principle then, that the first couple of chapters, the first um, focuses on the figure of an actual um, tyrant who claimed to enthroned himself surrounded by an image of the cosmos, which is the um, late Sasanian, the actual late Sasanian king of kings, Khosrow. Um, and there's tons of fables about him in Greek, in Latin, in Persian, in Arabic, um, that say that he did this, and it's almost always a bad thing. So that's at the beginning in order to say, people do have an idea of this that is as um, pejorative as our sort of James Bond villain. It's this guy, actually, Khosrow. And then um, the second chapter, which is the, introduces the community stuff, is supposed to provide an alternative model um, for, thinking about these, um, uh, for thinking about these images. So it ultimately determined the structure of the book, but I think it probably was part of... I was very fortunate when I first came here, I only had to teach one class the first semester. And I think that's when things became clear to me as I was sort of <laughs> sitting back and figuring out what it was that I'd done. I, it was probably the moment when I realized that that had to be um, a part of it. So the mosaics on the um, mosque in Damascus uh, are seventh century, early seventh century, and and the uh, also the, the 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 dome inside Qusair Amra is just about the same time. Um, but if you, if you move f and if you were to move forward a hundred years mm -hmm. in those two locations, you would no longer find mosaics on mosques and mm -hmm. uh, and these desert. Retreats, uh, I think, were abandoned. Would you be able to? Uh, how would you make the argument if, uh, from the year 850? Sure. What, what kind? Where would you be going to find the relationship between cosmos and community? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, these are really so. Uh, both the Mosque Damascus and Qusair Amra, sort of early 700s, and the sort of the second half of the Umayyad. Um, uh, dynasty, and uh, this dynasty ends precipitously in the middle of the 8th century, uh, and you get a reorientation of the state towards Mesopotamia. So you had this kind of Syrian Mediterranean center for the first century or so um, of the caliphate, and then it gets reoriented really towards um, with Iraq um, as its center. And there's a ton of changes, we think, in artistic production that go along with that shift, but the fact is that we have very little monumental architecture preserved um, from the Abbasids. We have the stories about the city of Baghdad, um, and we have the massive excavations that Herzfeld conducts at, at Samara, the sort of second capital, um, but that's about it. We don't have a lot of Abbasid monuments that stand that we can point to. Um, that are comparable to the things that we have in Syria from the Umayyad. So that's just a big question mark, I think, in Islamic art history, is what happens um, at the center under the Abbasids. So there was, and in fact, I, don't, I, I decided at some point that I didn't believe this, there is this um, long 
running scholarly tradition, which begins with Kenneth Creswell, who's one of the earliest um, historians of Islamic ar architecture about Qubba al-Qadr, and the argument is that there are these texts that say there's a green dome in um, the palace at Damascus and in the palace uh, at Baghdad, and beginning with Creswell, it was argued that this was actually a dome of heaven. In fact, there was a representation of the stars inside it, but this rests on nothing, and so I decided just to chuck it um, and not to include it uh, in the account. So for me, that intervening century and a half or so uh, is a huge question mark, and it, 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 so I just don't deal with it because I just I don't know what you can say either as a positive or a negative. But what is clear is that by the time you hit um, 1,000, uh, you get at the Buyid court um, a, a scholar, a Sufi, uh, who produces this uh, book of the fixed stars, uh, which includes images of the constellations. And it's partly an antiquarian um, effort to represent the constellations as they're represented in pre-Islamic Arabic traditions, um, and so you get the sort of basically the Bedouin constellations, and then also to juxtapose those with the Greco-Roman uh, constellations. And this thing takes off immediately. So we have in the Bodleian um, an autograph copy, not by Asufi, but by his son. Uh, and then uh, we have almost immediate, so Moya Carey is the scholar who's done the most work on these. Um, it, it, production on the range of, I forget exactly, 70 or 80 preserved medieval manuscripts of this that include the images. And in fact, it goes into print. So we also have early printed um, copies of it as well. So that's where, if I, to hang the argument that you get a kind of um, commitment to and prevalence of these images in the Islamic and in the you know, Frankish, like I'd say, European worlds, um, that we don't get in the Byzantine. The key there for the Islamic world is actually not structures like this. Um, it is strictly a Sufi and the various sort of, so those ultimately become primarily two manuscript traditions. But you do get to a point then um, where you start to have monumental reflections of those images that are being traded in manuscripts. And so in the Islamic world, that really comes in with the Seljuks, and it comes in in metalwork, um, it comes in in some public monuments. There's this bridge, basically in Kurdistan, um, near a place called Jizra, uh, that has the signs of the zodiac sculpted in relief on the bridge. You get a kind of new monumentality, which is similar to what you get in France, um, and uh, mostly in France, in the portals of churches, where suddenly the zodiac will be carved as a sort of, um, in a new monumental form. So what I imagine is there being a sort of late antique, late, late antiquity, where a kind of monumental, monumentality perseveres, and then you get kind of a question mark, and perseverance through manuscripts, and finally a reemergence in monumental production, and that seems to me to chart pretty well at slightly different um, timescales what happens um, in the Frankish world and what happens um, in the Islamic world. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>